Wow, I think Jesus was on to something here. He started out by repeating what the uh, Jewish people called the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Now, if we talk about loving the Lord, your God, first of all, we have to think about what is our image of God? You know, a lot of people have images of God that make it very difficult for them to love God. They think of God as the judge. They think of him as sort of a super policeman. Um, it's sort of like he's standing there with this sledgehammer in his arm waiting for you to make a mistake so he can bonk you on the head. Some people think of God as, as the very distant and therefore not really a part of their lives. But if we are to understand the commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, we have to understand that our image of God needs to be that God is loving and caring. If we think of God as loving and caring, then indeed we can think about putting our faith and our trust in God. Now, when we think about loving the Lord your God, we also have to think about what is your place for God. I think in all too many cases, uh, people sort of have developed a compartmentalized faith. Um, I've read various accounts of a, a group called Pew that puts out religious surveys. And in many cases, they find out that there's not much difference between what the Christian population believes and what the popular uh, culture is teaching. Now, I think to myself, why is that? And I think one of the reasons is that there are people that have developed a compartmentalized faith. Now, I'm going to illustrate what I mean by that. Well, there's God. We put God in this compartment. And then ourself, we put self in another compartment. And okay, let's say we have a job that goes over here. We have our home. We have our family. Um, we have our leisure, we have church. Now, if you have a compartmentalized faith, then you come to church on Sunday and you say, okay, my religious obligations are over, now I'll go home and just kind of go on with life. If you have this compartmentalized approach, then of course you don't have to think about how God is going to affect your daily life. And when that happens, I think it results in people uh, saying they're Christian and yet not showing up an awful lot of difference between them and the culture around them. I think for us, we really need to develop 
a much different approach. God needs to be at the center. God needs to be the, the overriding influence on our life. Then God affects self, family, job, otherwise, do the people at your job have any inkling that you're Christian? If they don't, doesn't that kind of point to this compartmentalized approach to life? God should be the center of your home, your leisure activities, And, of course, God should be at the center of your church experience. Church, obviously, should be more than just a social uh, activity. Now, I think that part of the issue then comes down to how comfortable are you with our pop popular culture? Now, I can honestly say that when I was growing up, there wasn't a lot of conflict between popular culture and Christian faith. But the times have changed. And now, there are a lot of conflicts that have developed between popular culture and our faith. For example, moral relativism is becoming very much in vogue. Otherwise, there are no absolutes. You know, it's, it's like uh, if you think something's good, then that makes it good. If we don't have God as our foundation, then we're subject to moral relativism. Political correctness. I didn't even know what that was until a few years ago. <laughs> and more and more, I am finding myself at great odds with political correctness. Now, I'm going to give you a current example. And I realize that some of you may feel just like popular culture does on this one. But I have a little different take. Paula Dean said something that she shouldn't have said. Now, was it right for her to say what she did? No. And I don't condone it. But what I don't like is the way she has absolutely been crucified in our popular culture. It's like somehow nobody has ever said anything that they shouldn't say. But if you do, we're going to get you and we're going to get you hard. And that example is just one of many that I see where political correctness just grinds people into the earth as if none of us were sinners and none of us have ever said something that we felt horrible about saying. So, that's an area where I find myself in conflict with popular culture. Now, when I was growing up, religious freedom was, was sacrosanct. And I always thought it was so solid in our culture that it would never become a problem. <coughs> but it has. To the point where now, <coughs> it's almost like Christians are the only group that you can really nail 
and get away with it. Because all, all these other groups, you know, you can't touch them. Religious freedom is something that I think is sacred. And I think that we need to stand up for it. Um, and I can give you an example that, that kind of fits in here. You know, when I was growing up again, Sunday morning was church time. And the rest of society let it alone. But not anymore. Now you have all kinds of activities being planned for Sunday morning. And here's the one that gets me. They have children's sports activities that they have on Sunday morning. And if your kid's going to be on that team, they're going to be there at the game on Sunday morning. Well, if I was a parent with a young one, I'm afraid that I would have to say to that coach or whoever, no way. Uh, if my child has to do it on Sunday morning, they're not going to be involved. Where do we get the idea that, that the kids have to be involved in every single activity and we as parents have nothing to say about it? So I think loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul includes taking a serious look at you and our popular culture. And if you don't find that you've got some conflicts there, I'm concerned about that. Because I think loving God means that we have to take some stands. There is such a thing as right and wrong. It isn't all relative. Now, it also says in the first commandment that Jesus mentioned, love the Lord your God with all your mind. Well, faith is rational as well as emotional. Uh, I would have to say that when I was growing up, there was kind of, it leaned a little bit, maybe too much in the emotional direction and not enough in the rational. I think we need to have a balance there. Uh, yes, we need to have a relationship with Jesus that has our emotions involved, but it also needs to have our intellect. Christians should be studied, read the Bible, Read Christian literature. <laughs> Keep up on the meaning of your faith. And I'm going to direct this maybe a little bit more towards retirees, but it applies to everybody. And that is, don't become a couch potato if you retire and just sit there and vegetate. And please don't watch a bunch of mindless TV shows that often have very poor values. And we have no business as Christians supporting those shows with no values. But I would go beyond that. Not only don't become a college potato, but keep your mind occupied and engaged. Don't get mentally lazy. I think there's a reason that the commandment says to love God with all of your mind as well as your heart and soul. I've been reading several uh, medical journals that stress to stay healthy, you need to keep your mind engaged. So take intellectual things seriously. Don't become mentally lazy and just kind of, uh, well, I'm retired. I don't need to read and keep up on things. You need to keep that mind engaged because if you don't, the stuff that's in here starts kind of draining up. <laughs>
Then Jesus said the second commandment, which is like the first, is to love your neighbor as yourself. That comes from Leviticus 19.18. Love yourself properly. In order to love your neighbor, you have to first love yourself. Now, what I don't mean by that is you don't become narcissistic, boastful, bragging, stuck on yourself. That is not loving yourself. That's a total misunderstanding of the concept. To love yourself, you have to develop a true self-esteem. Now, when I say a true self-esteem, I, I think back uh, a number of years ago, there was, there was kind of a movement in education about teaching self-esteem. I think the goal was fine, but I think the process used was, was often missed the point. True self-esteem comes from doing something that you can feel good about. It doesn't come from standing in front of a mirror and saying, I'm great. I'm wonderful. That's not true self-esteem. So if we develop true self-esteem and we value integrity, that is, how do you act when nobody's around to observe? If you can honestly be true to yourself in those situations, you have integrity. But if you know there's nobody watching and you say, well, okay, then I'll do this or that, then you're kind of missing integrity part. You love yourself properly, then you're in a position to love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that the emphasis we're developing here at Bethany is on track. And that is we're trying to become more and more involved in reaching out to our neighbors. That's as it should be. A faith that becomes ingrown is not healthy. So we need to continue to look for ways that we can reach out to our neighbors. That we can serve. You know, Jesus talked an awful lot about the heart of a servant. And that's what we need to develop, the heart of a servant where we truly see a need to be giving and not just receiving you know people who have their hands out all the time they're not developing a healthy approach to life and the people who are giving of themselves that's taking Jesus seriously when he says love your neighbor as yourself. So, I think Jesus was really on to something here when he was asked the question, what is the great command? First of all, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. Amen.